Good morning. Welcome to this panel on the challenge of extended deterrence. My name is Matthew Kranig. I'm an associate professor of government and foreign service here at Georgetown University. Um, extended deterrence may be the most important distinguishing feature of US nuclear strategy. Uh, unlike other countries that use their nuclear weapons primarily to deter attacks against themselves, uh, the United States uses its nuclear weapons uh, essentially to deter attacks on the entire free world. Uh, we have extended nuclear deterrence commitments to the 28 other members of NATO, Japan, South Korea, and arguably other countries. Uh, and so this is what we're going to discuss today. Uh, and this is a conference on the theory and practice of nuclear weapons. Uh, and so we're going to talk about some of the theories, concepts, uh, for understanding extended deterrence in the academy. Uh, but we're going to talk about how those apply to the real world. Uh, which of these theories and concepts is helpful? Uh, which of them need to be updated? Uh, to discuss these issues, I'm delighted to be joined by an excellent panel. Uh, to my left is Charles Glazer. He's a professor of international affairs at George Washington University and the director of the Security and Conflict uh, Center there. Uh, to his left is Frank Gavin. Frank is a professor at Johns Hopkins University and the director of the Kissinger Center at Johns Hopkins. And then uh, all the way down at the end of the table is Brad Roberts. Uh, Brad is the director of the Center for Global Security Research at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and formerly served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy in the Obama administration. Uh, so we have a great lineup, a diversity of views. Uh, we have a political scientist, a historian, and a policy practitioner. Uh, each of our um, uh, speakers will speak for about 15 minutes. I may provide a, a brief comment at, at the end, and then we'll open it up for question and answers uh, from the audience. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll begin, uh, we'll just work our way down the table and begin with uh, Professor Glazer, whenever you're ready. Thanks, good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was asked to sort of provide a little bit of background and also then about extended deterrence and also explain what's new about it. And I think thinking about the background is helpful in terms of what's new. So I'm gonna start just by talking about some of the basics of extended nuclear deterrence. And as, as already has been mentioned by a few people this morning, uh, extended deterrence is typically understood to be much harder than deterring attacks against yourself, and specifically because your interest in your ally, even if they're large, are not nearly as large as their interest in your own survival. This is particularly the case when you face a nuclear adversary because then the risks of defending that adversary are potentially huge. I mean, there are costs in protecting, conventionally protecting an ally, but when you face a nuclear adversary, you could be starting a nuclear war, and one actually has been highlighted already, one that could actually, in the case of the US, China, or the Soviet Union, and now Russia, blow up the world. The problem is, just to be clear, is that since your interests are smaller, the adversary understands that you're willing to run a smaller risk, or, or logically should be, the adversary understanding that then might doubt the credibility of your threats. Even if you say you will do something, you may not do it. So much of the um, effort in the Cold War was to try and make our threats of um, extended deterrence credible. And we had a particularly difficult or, or challenge because we were not trying to threaten, deter nuclear attacks with nuclear second use. We were trying to deter conventional attacks with nuclear first use. And so even though that's often thought to be like a very bad policy, we would use nuclear weapons first. In fact, that was what our, NATO's policy was. Actually, what NATO's policy still is, it's less, much less urgent um, because the threat is much smaller. It was seen to be necessary during the Cold War because the conventional wisdom about the conventional balance um, was that NATO was inferior, that NATO had a reasonable chance of actually losing a full-scale conventional war against the Warsaw Pact. And so nuclear weapons then and extended deterrence were the way to make up for this conventional shortfall. We can get an argument, John Mearsheimer um, argued in the early 80s with a number of other people that the conventional balance was much more uh, um, favorable to NATO um, than the conventional wisdom. And in fact, that NATO had a good chance of holding. But he also argued, which some people forget, which was that nevertheless, NATO should keep its first use policy because sometimes things could go badly and you could lose conventionally or the adversary might not appreciate how good your conventional forces were and therefore should have to face a nuclear threat of escalation. 
So even these sort of con conventional balance optimists tend to be in favor of first use. Given the challenge of extended deterrence, NATO pursued a variety of mechanisms um, to make its threats credible. And so I thought it's useful to go through those now, partly because we might want to think about, particularly I'm going to focus on Asia, which of those mechanisms um, we might want to employ or even have the option of employing to protect Japan. So first, NATO itself, as a, as a treaty organization that was deeply institutionalized, put US credibility on the line. So having a deep commitment actually can enhance your extended deterrent threat because um, you said you will do something. And there's a whole debate about whether not doing something will hurt you in the future, but countries tend to worry about their future credibility. We can argue about that. My own view is it probably makes little sense to get in a nuclear war now to convince somebody down the road that you will get in a nuclear war later. But you know, if my one nuclear war at a time is plenty. Avoid them when you can. But in any event, there is that argument. So um, second, and I think much more persuasively, the United States, as part of NATO, deployed very, very large conventional forces in Europe right up against the inter-German border and across the alliance. And this had two very important effects for deterrence. One was, if we, could, if we could convince the Soviet Union that they couldn't win, or the Warsaw Pact that it couldn't win, then they should be deterred by what we call deterrence by denial. So large conventional forces just meant that you could defeat the adversary, and if they realized that, they would be deterred. But they also played a very important second role of being what would be called, in Tom Schelling's term, or just intuitively, a tripwire. Those forces meant that the United States was going to be in the war. If the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact launched this massive conventional attack, US forces in, a, in very large numbers would be fighting and be killed. And even though sunk costs are sunk, um, most people think that getting involved um, in that scale war would have drawn the United States into a large war, that it would not have been able to pull out once its forces were attacked in a large way. And then third, in addition to the, the, the treaty commitment and the commit forward conventional forces, the United States deployed um, in cooperation with its allies very large numbers of theater nuclear weapons in Europe. And so um, it, made, it had an explicit nuclear first use doctrine that was basically, if we are losing a conventional war, we retain the right um, to use nuclear weapons first, and arguably we will. It was never clear whether it would be strategic nuclear forces or theater nuclear forces that would be used first. They might have been used in combination. But anyway, there were literally thousands at the peak of the Cold War, I think 7,000 um, theater nuclear forces, relatively small yield, but actually quite a large range of yields and deployments in Europe. Um, and these created or added to the deterrent in a variety of ways. First, they made it reasonable, just intuitively, although it wasn't really necessary. There were nuclear weapons there that they would get used. Maybe much more important, many of them were vulnerable, and their command and control was vulnerable. And so early in a war, these forces were going to be dispersed with the troops. Um, and many people believe that authority to use those nuclear weapons was pre-delegated, would have been pre-delegated, because once they were out of garrison, um, there was no guarantee that they could communicate with central command. Um, once you've done that, there's all sorts of possibilities that those nuclear weapons could get used in an unauthorized way. That a commander thought that he was supposed to use them and had the actual physical ability to do them, to use them, or actually could end up using them by accident for a variety of reasons. These things are relatively unlocked compared to their peacetime circumstances. On the one hand, this is quite dangerous for all the reasons I just said. On the other hand, it's quite effective. If the adversary understands this, I don't think we advertised enough to the Soviet Union exactly what was going to happen. But if the adversary understands this, this really is a threat, um, like in Thomas Schelling's terminology, that leaves something to chance. Nuclear weapons could get used, and they become out of the control of the political leadership. So that was the second, uh, that was the second piece of the the nuclear threat. And the third was that we had large numbers of limited nuclear options in our strategic nuclear forces, forces based in the United States or long range on missiles. Um, they were also committed to um, a, a limited, at this point, very large war, but the possibility of a limited war. In this case, unlike the theater forces, the, these long range nuclear forces would probably be used against um, targets at that time that were in the Soviet Union. So we had this quite intricate and quite extensive set of, you could call them think of kind of tactics that were used to make the extended deterrent threat credible. 
Um, even with that, there was a debate throughout the Cold War about whether our threat was sufficiently credible. Um, our European allies tended to worry much more um, about its credibility than Americans, who tended to be more confident. And I think we believe that the Russians believed, um, that, or the Soviets, that they faced a major threat. OK, so what's different today? And I'm going to focus on Japan, not because it's most important, um, but it is very important. Um, and some of these things came up earlier. But I want to mention, I think, three significant differences. Two strike me the most. First is that there's a range of scenarios that we need to worry about that could involve attacks against Japan that go from relatively low interest and relatively small attacks, but nevertheless potentially against the Japanese homeland, to quite large attacks against Japan. Um, and I'll say what those are. But certainly after the beginning, the early Cold War, by the time you get to the 1960s, all of NATO's strategy was focused essentially on one scenario. And it was a very large war that was designed, in our eyes at least, that we worried about, which was designed to conquer Western Europe. And the fact that it was large in some ways made, as was mentioned earlier, I think by Fiona and others maybe, actually made extended deterrence easier. Because the stakes, at least as, as extended deterrence goes, the stakes were high. And the war was going to be large and, in a certain sense, fast. The three scenarios I identify for Japan, and there are more, but one is you can imagine a scenario in which um, you have a conflict between China and Japan over, in, I think, more likely in the, um, in the East China Sea, but possibly in the South China Sea, where you have a skirmish that somehow um, escalates to a larger war. Um, that, to me, it seems like that's a scenario in which clearly nuclear weapons, we, have an, we may have an extended deterrence responsibility. We've officially put the Senkaku Daiyu under the US-Japan Treaty. Um, but it's hard to see how nuclear weapons would fit into that calculation. But there are prominent Japanese strategists that have said, it's, if the United States loses its nuclear advantage, its ability to limit damage with respect to China, it may become more assertive in this East China Sea. So some Japanese strategists actually see a connection between the small disputes in the East China Sea all the way up to nuclear, which implies that there's some escalatory set of mechanisms there and that that should be part of our nuclear deterrent. I would just say in this case, this looks to me like a case where you just say nuclear weapons are not relevant. These, uh, these little islands or little rock piles or whatever they are, seven square kilometers, less than the Georgetown campus. Um, these just don't fall under the nuclear umbrella. They're under the alliance, but they're just not under the nuclear umbrella, sorry. Um, second scenario is a Taiwan scenario. Not a scenario that's designed to attack Japan, but the United States coming to the aid of Taiwan and China attacks Japan because US forces in Japan will be playing a very important role in the Taiwan scenario. And also Japan now has responsibilities to support US operations against in helping the United States defend Taiwan. And so China is going to have a direct military in incentive, if not absolute need, to attack Japan. So at this point, we have direct attacks against an ally, putting aside anything about Taiwan. And the question is, what role do nuclear weapons play in deterring those attacks? Um, I want to argue, I think, that they should play none. Um, but it's getting to be a harder case. The reason I would say none is because even though Japan is getting attacked and it will suffer significant damage, it's actually quite limited damage. I mean, these are conventional attacks against military bases, not used for coercion, but simply to fight the war. Um, and I have a, my sense is that in that scenario, and particularly given the stakes, which are not Japan but are Taiwan, um, that we should actually not rely on nuclear weapons. Um, and Bridge said earlier, of course, you should always have all options on the table. Um, I want to come back to that at the very end of my remarks. Um, then the third scenario, which actually can blur into the second scenario, or blur from the second scenario, is a scenario in which China actually puts coercive pressure on China um, or tries to invade it. Invasion, I think most people think China is not interested, and it's incredibly hard and unlikely, but it's the worst scenario, or the, you know, the most challenging scenario. But it could well be that if a Taiwan scenario drags out, um, and, is, and is looking like a long war, that China may decide to blockade Taiwan to try and push both Japan and the United States out of the war 
or it could actually use kinetic attacks against value, kinetic conventional attacks against value targets in Japan to try and force the, China, the Japanese out of the war. It, these last scenarios, then you have lar potentially large-scale damage, um, not, not survival-level damage, but large-scale damage. And in the worst scenario, a case where maybe China is trying to force Japan to make concessions about its sovereignty um, or vital interests. So I guess the, the bottom line there is that the three scenarios, only one of which, in which we have an ally involved, only one of which I would think is, close, is a close call for nuclear extended deterrence. So this brings, I think Bridge Colby is spot on on this point, which is that for all, the, for all these issues in Asia, the first order of business is adequate conventional deterrence, and if deterrence fails, the ability to prevail conventionally. And the hard case, I think, is a really large conventional war that, that one, by one path or another brings in Japan. So then you have the question of first use. Do I have a couple more minutes? Am I? Two more minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so then you get into a question about how we should think about first use to protect Japan in that single scenario. But I would say one thing just in making important distinctions about the past is we didn't go through, except possibly at the very beginning of the Cold War, this kind of analysis of different scenarios of different levels. It was like one scenario. Now we have to really, th part of what I'm arguing here, which is different in the Cold War also, is that there are some interests that are not worth protecting with nuclear weapons, which in some ways is sort of jarring. You go, well, any interest of an ally is worth, no, actually, there are some conventional wars that are better to lose than turn into a nuclear war. Um, and that sort of seems obvious too. So you can look at it from one angle and it's obvious you should rely on nuclear weapons and you can look at it from another and it's obvious that it's a bad idea. Um, so the question is on Japan, which I won't, actual invasion or coercion of Japan, which I don't have time to go into, but then you really get into this question, which is not unrelated to the analysis in the Cold War, which is how, what is the conventional balance for Japan? How well are we able to deter a, con a substantial conventional attack against Japan or defeat it? And the good news is that a variety of factors favor conventional protection of Japan. First of all, it does, it's not right next to China. It's separated by some distance and it's separated by water, which actually enables the alliance to much better protect Japan um, than, the, than arguably NATO, or at least the challenge is much easier than the challenge to protect Western Europe. Second, people have looked in some detail at how the reach of China's um, denial, area denial capabilities. And people, it's an ongoing debate, but the argument is that China is not gonna be able to deny access to the eastern side of Japan. It makes it very, very hard to blockade Japan. And so the coercive potential of a long-term blockade is probably quite small because you just can't do it. You can't do it effectively. So all of these things, and I'm going to wrap up then, in terms of nuclear weapons, I think we can argue whether you want to have a first use policy or not. But what I want to argue, and I didn't have time to go into it, is first use, the risks of first use and the type of first use policies that you can design vary in the risks that they have. Like you can have a NATO type possibility where you actually lose control of your weapons. Or you can have a first use policy where you have complete control over your weapons and the only way that they get used is when you get an authoritative decision from the civilian leadership. I would say, given the good prospects, um, in, for depending on Japan, that we should have what I would call low risk, at most, a low risk first use policy. Um, and that reflects not the importance of Japan, but the prospects for conventional deterrence. Thank you very much, Professor Glazer. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Glazer. A rich set of remarks, and I'd like to dig into some of those issues more in the discussion period. Uh, but first, uh, we have Professor Frank Gavin uh, from Johns Hopkins University. <laughs> Professor Gavin, whenever you're ready. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Good to see you. We were just debating these issues uh, less than a week ago. And thank you, Keir, um, and your colleagues for putting together um, such a really impressive group of uh, people, collection of talent. It's a real honor to be here. I'm also very impressed how many people show up at Georgetown for a conference on uh, nuclear weapons. I'm going to have to get my SAIS students to up their game a bit. Uh, kudos <laughs> to you. So Kira asked us to be provocative, um, and I don't want to disappoint. And what I would suggest is perhaps the biggest problem with this subject may be its misleading name, extended nuclear deterrence. Why do I say that? I say that because I think extended nuclear deterrence is often portrayed just like deterrence, 
but just bigger, larger, of greater scope. I actually think this is wrong. Uh, I think they are profoundly different concepts and strategies with a very different history and an unusual history. And this, uh, our inability to recognize this leads to great misunderstanding both in our theories and in our policies. How? Well, we all know deterrence is a simple, powerful concept. In order to prevent an adversary from harming you, you make it clear there will be grave consequences if they act upon that instinct. To deter your adversary, you have to make it clear that the deterrent threat is serious, which means you have to demonstrate the action they threaten is grave, and your willingness and capability to respond strong. When it comes to nuclear deterrence, this is quite easy to do. Recall the great scourge of human history, of world politics before the nuclear age, was invasion and conquest. A state with nuclear weapons, by merely possessing a plausible, survivable force, can easily achieve deterrence. The bomb is best thought of in this way as invasion insurance. And consider the United States. What does it actually need to deter in the nuclear age? Not much at all when you think about it. While the United States was obviously attacked at Pearl Harbor, no one has come close to invading and conquering the continental United States since the US Civil War. It's actually hard to imagine a circumstance where anybody could or would. And to prevent the Soviet Union from launching a bolt from the blue, a nuclear attack on the United States, it really wouldn't take very much to convince the Soviet Union that that was really a terrible idea. Just some survivable, deliverable nuclear weapons. But as we all know, this is not what happened. As we now know from great work going back to David Rosenberg and Mark Trachtenberg and continuing with the terrific work that Daryl and Keir have put together and Austin Long and Brendan Green, we now know that the United States constructed a far different force and a far different strategy. Massive, focused on counterforce, ready to be used preemptively. To understand why this developed is to understand why extended nuclear deterrence is not simply deterrence, just bigger, but something different altogether. And as a historian, I will highlight this with two stories from the Cold War. First, let's return to the early 1950s when American policymakers struggled to resolve two vexing but interconnected puzzles, the German question and the nuclear question. Germany, of course, had been understood as the cause of two horrific world wars. There had been an agreement after World War II that Germany could not be allowed to rise again although there were, of course, big debates over how this was to be done. As a unified but neutral country, as a divided but suppressed nation, a variety of events made it clear that the early decisions of the post-war period resolving around Germany would not hold. First, it became clear that Western Europe could not recover economically, and hence politically, unless the engine of its growth, Western Germany, was rehabilitated and integrated. Second, though, and more important for our purposes, there were four shocks between the summer of 1949 and the fall of 1950. First, the Soviets ending the atomic monopoly. Second, Mao and the communists taking power in mainland China. Third, North Korea's June 1950 attack on the South. And fourth, China's intervention against the United States in the fall of 1950 that made it clear that Europe was completely exposed and vulnerable and that the U.S. post-war policy of 1945 to 1949 was bankrupt. The old hope that Europe would recover and could defend itself, and that the Soviets would be too focused on their own rehabilitation and recovery, gave way to a fear that the U.S. was bogged down in Korea, the Soviets could then move quickly into Europe and take it with ease. In fact, it might not even take an invasion. Europe's nascent recovery could fail, the forces of neutralism increase, and Europe fall into the Soviet orbit if something was not done. So the United States faced a terrible dilemma. How could the United States defend Western Europe from a Soviet attack or even coercive pressure without bankrupting itself while facing scores of Soviet di divisions? Europe had to rearm, but for that to work, West Germany had to rearm as well, which produced the second puzzle. How do you rebuild the army of a nation that had within recent memory been the cause of such horror and suffering? On the flip side, how do you convince those same Germans that they should actually fight on your side? How would you do that in a nuclear environment? They aren't going to sign up 
with you if you either give up on Germany or fight the war and incinerate their own territory. The fact is, if you were going to deter the Soviet Union, who possessed overwhelming conventional superiority, you needed two things to do it. The participation of West Germany's military and nuclear weapons. But for obvious reasons, you couldn't mix these two together, since that would cause World War III. If the Soviets didn't attack a nuclear-armed Germany, your own allies might. There would be no way you could keep an alliance together under those circumstances. And to keep the Germans engaged and enthusiastic, you had to plan to fight the war with the Soviets on or before the intra-German border, which meant you had to use nuclear weapons as the Soviets were massing in the east, which meant you had to be preemptive, in other words, attack while they were mobilizing, which meant you had to hit all their targets, which means you needed a massive force, half-cocked, ready to go. That is what you see in NATO's MC-48 strategy, developed in the mid-1950s, which in one form or another was the backbone of U.S. nuclear strategy in Europe till the very end of the Cold War. I've written elsewhere about this, um, how one of the core features of this posture, preemptive, counterforce, not limited, uh, changed far less during the Cold War than we thought. Uh, there's even some characteristics to it now. Part of this was because of technical and technological challenges, something that Keir knows better than anybody of how this worked. But a good part of it was driven by the credibility demands of extended nuclear deterrence. Now, to be clear, this was not the only strategic option available to the United States in the early 1950s. There were choices that could have been made. You could have built a massive, expensive, conventional force that would have cost a fortune and flown in the face of every U.S. grand strategic, economic, and political tradition up to that point and created what Eisenhower called a garrison state. You could have given West Germany nuclear weapons. You could have cut a deal with the Soviets for a unified, neutral Germany and hoped Germany didn't rise again or become dominated by the closer Soviet Union. This, by the way, was the preferred policy of that great realist, George Kennan. How unpalatable and risky these other options were only highlights why the U.S. chose what, in retrospect, seems like a very aggressive, very expensive, very counterforce, and very preemptive strategy. This was the birth of extended nuclear deterrence. It was strange, it was dangerous, it was far from defensive as one can imagine. Now think forward five years after this, as this strategy is in place in Europe. Berlin is a divided city in the middle of enemy territory, indefensible with NATO conventional forces. The Soviets and the East Germans threatened to change the status of the city. Not unreasonable, by the way, and not something the Americans thought was unreasonable. Nor could the city be defended. Both Kennedy and Eisenhower recognized both these facts. But the United States strategy, based on extended nuclear deterrence, is that it will deter such actions with the threat of a nuclear first strike against the Soviet Union and its Eastern European Empire. Consider that for a moment. Say the Soviets had, for some strange reason, half of Miami. And they said they would not change its isolated, protected status. And that if you, the United States, or the state of Florida, decided you wanted to change it, they would launch a first strike against you. Consider that the main reason that Khrushchev had launched this crisis in the first place was actually to deter the Americans from getting, giving nuclear weapons to the West Germans. But to assure the West Germans that they didn't need their own nuclear weapons, you had to threaten thermonuclear war to protect an indefensible territory, 100 miles within enemy territory, possessing no geostrategic value whatsoever. Is that deterrence? Is that defensive? Now, of course, I'm exaggerating here for effect. And the story is complicated. It's, of course, not clear throughout this story when you talk about extended nuclear deterrence, whether extended nuclear deterrence is not actually a form of compellence. Think about extended nuclear deterrence and what it actually does. It tells an enemy we will whack them. Not if they hit us, mind you, but a friend. To make that threat credible, we will threaten to use nuclear weapons first, fast, and furiously. And we will tell our friends that we are protecting that they can't have their own nuclear weapons, which is the obvious answer to this problem. There's little in this posture that is stable or defensive. Now, this is not to say it wasn't effective, mind you. Extending nuclear deterrence helped solve the most dangerous, threatening, difficult, and explosive issue of the post-war period, how to let first West Germany then a reunified Germany, recover and politically rehabilitate in a responsible manner without unleashing World War III.
Not an easy problem, and we can count that as a success. The strategy was so successful, it was applied to the rest of Europe, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, other similarly vexing geopolitical situations. And when extended nuclear deterrence was extended more broadly, it played a crucial role, in fact, I would argue the most important role in limiting the number of nuclear weapon states in the world. If you had told people in 1960 that the number would be in the single digits in 2019, they would ask what you were smoking. You can even make an Andy Marshall-like case that this strategy fueled a nuclear arms race that played directly to American strengths and employed, exploited Soviet weaknesses. How? Well, to extend deterrence, you had to deter your adversary and assure your ally that you were credible, which means you needed a preemptive counterforce strategy, which means you had to spend a fortune on technological advances, ASW, silencing, accuracy, speed, stealth, sensors, c cubed I, all the stuff that Daryl and Keir have explained so well to us. Once SALT constrained the quantitative limits, you could actually compete with the Soviets qualitatively and take advantage of what you did best building expensive, effective technology and exploit their weaknesses and bankrupt them. Now, this is obviously a controversial question. I'm not saying that I think this is necessarily the correct history. You could say that this is a bit retrospective. But it is clear from Soviet documents that building these forces, these forces which were clearly related to the desire to increase the credibility of extended nuclear deterrence, scared the Soviets to death. You see this in the records. You see them talking about Pershing II, MX, ASW, SDI. And they felt they had to respond. And the way they responded did, in fact, expose their weaknesses. Now, I point this all out not to say whether this policy was wise or not. Extended nuclear deterrence did limit proliferation, and it did put enormous pressure on the Soviets. But it was dangerous and expensive. Rather, I point this out to reveal how radical it was, and still is. It's not nuclear deterrence, just bigger, but a radical departure. How often in history have sovereign states forfeited, forfeited access to the best military technology, especially when it can guarantee their independence and sovereignty? When have they trusted others to protect them? This is especially odd when you consider it was the United States that was doing the protecting, a state that before 1950 avoided permanent military alliances like the plague, never had a mobilized military in peacetime, fought slow wars of attrition, had strong civilian oversight of the military, and a US Congress that ruled over the executive throughout most of its foreign policy history. The radical nature of extended nuclear deterrence changed all that, transformed America's grand strategic traditions, just as it transformed how many states understood and pursued their own security. Whether that is good or bad should be debated, but it was revolutionary and is revolutionary, and it was by no means inevitable. And these characteristics and its history should be better understood and recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gavin. Uh, last, we have Brad Roberts from uh, the Center for uh, Global Security uh, Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Brad, when you're ready. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'll stay at my seat as at Bridge, uh, so I'm closer to my notes. Uh, I'd like to add my thanks to Keir and all of you for making the time for this conversation. Uh, I spent uh, 27 years in the think tank world before going into my government role in 2009. Uh, and in the 14 years of that that preceded the shift to the Pentagon, uh, I had precisely one project on extended deterrence. Uh, and that was in 2008 uh, for a Defense Department sponsor. And this was in the context of 15 years or so of work on counterproliferation and nuclear policy and strategy. It was an indication of the times. Extended deterrence fell off our screen uh, after the end of the Cold War uh, and became an afterthought for those few people who were still engaged in questions of nuclear policy and nuclear strategy. So I went from famine to feast. Uh, because extended deterrence was immediately a priority of President Obama uh, following uh, his early interactions with allies who were very concerned about what the pathway to Prague, some of whom were very concerned about what the pathway to Prague might be. Uh, and moreover, we lived in a security environment which presented a series of new challenges to our extended deterrence 
relationships. So my inbox as a government official in the Pentagon working nuclear policy was full of extended deterrence questions. Uh, and in the world in which we lived, the answers we needed to find needed to fit two very different environments. And I had two maps on my wall in, in, in my office to illustrate the point. One is the map used by the NATO nuclear planning cell. So NATO is an alliance without enemies, by self-definition. NATO is an alliance that doesn't maintain nuclear plans against any country, but it plans in order to have the skill. How does it do that? It has a map. It has a map, a perfect map of Europe with Russia, uh, no Africa, some islands, um, north of uh, Norway, some more islands, and they're enemy states, and the planning is conducted against these, uh, these, these enemy states, and then the plans are burned at the end of the day. The other map is the map that at that point hung on the wall behind the desk of the um, policy director in the Japanese Ministry of Defense. And we usually have maps of uh, Japan on the, the vertical. This was Japan on the horizontal, with Asia pressing down on top. All of the names, not just of the big cities, but the smaller. You could feel the weight of this continent pushing on uh, Japan. And then the range rings of missiles from China and North Korea. Uh, at the very bottom of the map, Guam. And where's America on the map? Hmm. Uh, and our extended deterrence policies and strategies needed to fit these two very different, different environments. Uh, my, my inbox, uh, I, I, uh, in making notes for this discussion, I thought the simplest way to do this would be chronologically. Uh, issues came in regularly <clears throat> that required me to go to the extended deterrence theory cupboard and rummage through the cupboard to find something that might illuminate the problem that was in, that was in front of us. Uh, usually the bottom shelf had some really interesting but kind of dusty stuff. Uh, and, and the upper shelves were empty. Uh, work from the 1990s and 2000s, in other words, um, on extended deterrence was, was all essentially non-existent. The first issue that crossed my bow in this role was uh, in the consultations with Japan and South Korea. Uh, the United States government never had formal consultations with the governments of Japan and South Korea on matters nuclear, extended deterrence. Uh, and this was a revelation to all three countries in 2009, and we took steps to remedy that. Very clear early in the conversations with both countries was their familiarity with the Chicago for Berlin problem, uh, decoupling. You know, in one of my first meetings with the Japanese, they were all speaking Japanese. There was an interpreter. Uh, I didn't understand a word of Japanese, but I heard the word decoupling. <laughs> Uh, and that, that was an indicator of what was to come. And of course, they had made an intense study of shelling and wanted to understand and, and took a rather dim view of the leaving something uh, to, to chance uh, and um, were very focused on the role of missile defense in recoupling. Uh, they had a theory for how the problem presented by the Chicago for Berlin analogy had a different solution in the post-Cold War world where we faced uh, a rogue state, North Korea, with uh, modest capability, unlike anything like the kinds that the Soviets had, thus presenting a different possible solution. Um, I would say also the Japanese, and, uh, and not just the Japanese, uh, became very interested in uh, moving away from de deterrence was something provided by the United States and then there was defense that we do together into, into a world in which we do deterrence and defense together. So the, the latest version of the Japanese National Defense Planning Guidelines, for example, talk about the deterrence of the US-Japan alliance. And this is a different way of thinking about, uh, they're, they're not claiming a nuclear role for themselves, uh, but they, they, they see the deterrence toolkit is having expanded to include non-nuclear strike, ballistic missile defense, resilience in cyberspace, resilience in outer space, et cetera. All of that part of our deterrence posture, so there should be a, 
common alliance deterrence strategy. And I think that reflects the drift of thinking of many allies. Uh, the second problem to crop into my inbox was uh, in Europe, two decades of shrinking the nuclear umbrella, unguided by any theory. Um, how does one de-extend nuclear deterrence? And what is the proper measure of de-extension in a security environment that remains uncertain and unpredictable? Uh, and a mix of positive and negative trends. And there was uh, really nowhere to turn for particular thinking on that topic. This was intimately connected to the flip side of the equation, the assurance topic. Uh, some of you will recall the so-called Healy theorem. Dennis Healy, a former uh, a then Minister of Defense in the UK in the 1960s, famously said that in, when it comes to deterring the Soviet Union, we don't need to meet a very high bar of credibility because if it really, if war happens, it's all over for the Soviets, so 5% credibility is good enough for deterring uh, the Soviet Union. But when it comes to assuring your allies, well, for them to stay with you in the game, they need to know that they're going to escape that terrible consequence. 95% credibility is needed. And what, what does it take in today's world to assure our allies to the 95% or above level? What is assurance as distinct from deterrence, or how does it relate to deterrence? And frankly, I think we Americans often get that linkage wrong. We, we tend to say that there is um, something we do to assure our allies that's separate and apart from what we do for deterrence. Our allies are assured when the steps we're taking are reinforcing deterrence of the aggression that they fear. Uh, it, it's a very direct linkage. Uh, third topic. Uh, a main theme of the Obama administration was to adapt deterrence to ensure that it would remain effective for the problem for which it's relevant in the 21st century. Uh, to adapt deterrence generally in these two regions, but to adapt it specifically for the nuclear problem. And this brings us to the problem of limited nuclear war, which the prior panel talked about in, in some length. I, I won't go on, but er every time I dipped into that set of dusty books on the lower shelf. I found them writing about a world that we, we that was not the world we were struggling with. Um, Multi-domain, all-domain deterrence is a part of thinking about regional war with Russia and China and North Korea and, and Iran. Um, limited wars for limited stakes. This isn't the problem of all-out Armageddon-like war providing the context for a limited nuclear war. And the ease with which people use the words escalation control, escalation dominance, uh, concepts that were organizing and maybe instructive in the Cold War were simply uh, misleading, in my view. Here there was a lot of return uh, to Schelling's uh, manipulation of risk logic. Uh, and as Bridge has noted, I have tried to reintroduce into the discussion uh, a, a shorthand that I think people need and that I know has some Cold War baggage, but frankly, most of the people who need a shorthand don't care about the Cold War. Uh, and this is the label uh, theory of victory, uh, which in the Cold War meant something specific. It meant a theory of fighting and prevailing in a nuclear war and coming out the winner of a nuclear war. Uh, and I think we face three adversaries who have theories of victory in the spirit of Clausewitz and Sun Tzu. They believe that they can manipulate our risk to the point where we come to a culminating point where we're unwilling to run the risks and costs of continued war. And they do that in part by threatening nuclear employment and preparing for the possibility of limited employment if it comes to that. Uh, but a theory of victory also in the spirit of Sun Tzu, and primarily so. Uh, North Korea's Leader defines the, f the, the primary purpose of North Korea's nuclear program is to smash, oh, it's to, um, that's the Chinese saying, smash nuclear bullying. Uh, that was Mao's saying. Um, and there's an analog for, for North Korea, which is, of course, to break America's hostile ways. Uh, these are theories of victory about prevailing in the remaking of regional orders in a manner that's, that they prefer. Uh, and I haven't found uh, much coherent thinking 
uh, in, in our analytical community on these theories of victory, red and blue. Um, I note that the old logic of second centers of decision is again a logic that the Japanese, South Koreans, and some Central Europeans are bringing back into this discussion. If we face a new deterrence problem, we face new problems of American credibility, we face new problems of limited regional nuclear war, why not second centers of decision? Why not more of them? If that was right for NATO in the 60s, why not? Why is it not right for South, uh, Northeast Asia today? So one, two, three, four, the fourth problem in the inbox was presented by the um, red lines crossed in Ukraine and Syria. Uh, and this brought back to the fore a policy discussion of American credibility. What does it take to get it? What does it take to keep it? What do you do when it goes away? How permanent is it when it goes away? Uh, what are the lessons of past experience in the, the ebb and flow of American credibility? And there was not much written in the post-Cold War or new security environment context on, on this topic. Fifth issue. Uh, related to the, the need in our national nuclear strategy and our alliance nuclear strategies to have a balanced approach. Um, it's not politically tenable. It's not effective with our publics to say, all we're going to worry about is deterrence and defense. Don't worry about the rest of the nuclear problem. We need to have some agenda also for arms control and long-term disarmament. And trying to provide that balanced approach was an essential part of carrying forward the NATO nuclear discussion, an essential part of carrying forward the discussion with, in particular, the Japanese. Um, but here, it's difficult to find, it's been difficult to find, much new thinking about arms control. Uh, lots of simple, linear thinking about how to carry start another step. Um, not much thinking about what to do about Putin's attack on the European arms control architecture. Um, INF, of course, not being the only issue by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, not much thinking about disarmament, except either good or bad, but not a theory of how disarmament strategies might fit the security environment we live in today. Uh, and. Uh, I'd say uh, a, a debate um, among our allies in both Europe and Asia around, if you will, the propositions in, in Kristen's presentation. Are, are we in a security environment where the primary problem presented to us is the problem of the security dilemma, in which case more restraint should get us the outcome we want? or? Are we in an environment in which the other model that comes to people's mind is, we shorthand is Munich 1938, um, which is a, a bumper sticker for a different way of thinking, which is that um, no restraint proved to be part of the problem, not part of the solution. And I think that because we have evidence to support both and other theories, uh, but not sufficient evidence to prove that one is right and one is wrong, we have these debates in, in our alliances. We don't really actually have debates. We have gridlock. Uh, we have taboo topics. We have simply been unable to, as, as allies, resolve uh, these questions. Um, I would say that um, if there is a single common theme that cuts across this, it's, it, it relates to the word tailoring. So, you know, every presidential administration since the end of the Cold War has said that we have a nuclear strategy that's tailored to meet new challenges. Some have, some have emphasized tailored deterrence. Some have emphasized just broader tailoring. But the fact is, in the Cold War, we had one bipolar fundamental relationship heavily dominate, dominated by the nuclear dimension. And yes, allies were an important part of the picture but it was a pretty straightforward bipolar world. And yes, we had an assurance problem, 
and an extended deterrence challenge. Um, but in the security environment we've moved into, while there are multiple actors uh, of, of relevance to our uh, nuclear strategies, uh, Russia, China, there are multiple domains of, and North Korea and Iran, there are multiple domains of strategic competition and strategic consequence if there's war. Uh, we have our, the actors we wish to assure, the actors we wish to deter whom we also wish to assure. Um, some of the actors we wish to assure are allies we also wish to deter from doing things we don't want them to do. This is a much more complex landscape. And um, part of the challenge I constantly ran into in, in the Pentagon was finding ways to marry up the regional expertise with the new functional problem set. It wasn't enough to get the cyber people in the same room as the nuclear people or the missile people in the same room, the missile defense people in the same room. You couldn't have a meaningful discussion, of course, of extended deterrence on the Korean Peninsula without having the experts on South Korea and the different group of experts on North Korea and also some experts on the US-Japan alliance and also some China. I mean, you get the point. Um, we had a great simplification in the Cold War. And the extended deterrence problem brings home the fact that so long as we play this uh, role as a security guarantor in three different regions, we're going to uh, face the need to tailor our strategies in all of the ways I've suggested. Um, we were asked to highlight in, in closing the most important thing to understand about this problem. Well, I just hit one, and I want to hit one, one other one. Um, my experience is that extended deterrence has largely been a footnote for the community of people interested in nuclear strategy, at least for the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, I think extended deterrence is right at the center of the core challenges to our nuclear strategy. Our allies are in the crosshairs of the theories of victory, in my term, of our potential adversaries, major and non-major. Uh, and either we, the United States, will work with them to have credible policies and postures that address the, 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 the challenges by adversarial strategies, or our moment as a security guarantor will be eclipsed. Uh, and we, we think about one plausible pathway from there, which is that there would be a nuclear tipping point and then a cascade of proliferation among our uh, allies, uh, we should think about another possible pathway from there, which is a tipping point uh, and a cascade of appeasement strategies among our allies. It's very difficult for me to imagine the circumstances in which Germany or Japan would make the choice to go nuclear. Extremely difficult. And absent their choices, it's difficult to imagine their neighbors making their choice with the important footnote of South Korea, different context. Uh, so, Getting the extended deterrence agenda right, I think, is a central part of playing the role we have aspired to play as a nation for a long time. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to be coming to the audience for questions, so I would ask the members of the audience to begin thinking of your questions. Uh, before we do that, though, uh, Professor Lieber has uh, said I could provide a brief uh, remark, which I'll do, and then I'll um, ask the first question. Uh, so one of the questions uh, Professor Lieber asked us to consider is what are the concepts from nuclear strategy uh, that are helpful for understanding nuclear deterrence? Uh, and one that I've always found helpful uh, is nuclear brinkmanship. Um, so Thomas Schelling, uh, one of the great nuclear strategists, uh, recognized early on that countries face something of a problem in the nuclear era. You know, on one hand, they can't threaten to fight nuclear wars against nuclear armed adversaries because it could result in mutual suicide. Uh, on the other hand, they don't just want to back down and give their adversary anything at once because it has nuclear weapons. Uh, they still want to be able to use military forces, nuclear weapons, uh, to achieve their interests. Um, so how do they do that? And one of the things that Schelling argued is that they play these games of nuclear brinkmanship. Uh, there's kind of space in the middle between suicide and surrender. Uh, they make nuclear threats, put nuclear weapons on high alert, engage in conventional conflict, maybe limited nuclear conflict, uh, take steps to raise the risk of nuclear war, uh, hoping that the other side uh, will back down and you achieve your geopolitical interests. Uh, so Cuban Missile Crisis, Sino-Soviet Border War, 
uh, threats of fire and fury last summer, or some examples of these games of, of nuclear brinkmanship. Um, so thinking about US, um, you know, so essentially these countries are playing games of nuclear chicken. You know, if you think of uh, the 1950s uh, game, you know, two teenagers with hot rods uh, going at each other, and, and who swerves first? You know, which side wins? Um, which side loses? Um, but of course, there's always the danger that there could be a crash, and it results in, in disaster. Um, so when I think of uh, US extended deterrence, essentially, I think what we're promising to do is every day being prepared to play a game of nuclear chicken. Uh, really dozens of games of nuclear chicken every day. Uh, prepared to play a game of nuclear chicken on behalf of Estonia against Russia, a game of nuclear chicken on behalf of South Korea against North Korea, a game of nuclear chicken on behalf of Japan against China. Uh, and so um, every single day we're promising to play potentially dozens of games of nuclear chicken on behalf of relatively weak uh, regional allies in the face of formidable nuclear armed powers. Um, so who wins these games of nuclear chicken? Well, the conventional wisdom is it's all about stakes. Uh, that one country is going to care more than the other. Uh, therefore, that country is going to push harder and eventually win. Uh, the other country is going to care less. It's going to back down. Uh, so according to this account, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States basically achieved its objectives because for us, it was a small island off the coast of Florida. Uh, for the Soviet Union, it was about projecting power in a distant geopolitical region. Um, so if that's the case, then we're in trouble when it comes to extended deterrence, because there's at least a story that Putin can tell himself about why he cares more than Estonia than we do, a story that Kim Jong-un can tell himself that he cares more uh, about South Korea than we do, a story that President Xi can tell himself about why he cares more about Japan than we do. Um, so I think that this traditional uh, approach has missed something, which is it's not all about stakes, um, it's also about um, capabilities. Um, after all, if you were, uh, had to play dozens of games of nuclear chicken every day and you got a choice, would you prefer to drive a Hummer or a Prius? Um, I know I would prefer uh, to drive a Hummer. And so I think that's essentially the logic of American uh, nuclear strategy. And um, In fact, I wrote a book last year called The Logic of American Nuclear Strategy, uh, which argues that the United States uh, has these superior capabilities in part to offset its stakes deficits uh, in these games of nuclear chicken. So I think there's a lot of overlap between uh, Professor Gavin's uh, approach and, and mine, although maybe for, for different reasons. Um, uh, second comment, um, Frank, I don't know if you were looking for a response when you said, when in history has a country uh, done something like this? When have countries voluntarily given up access to the most important military technology in exchange for promises of protection from others? Uh, it just so happens I'm working on a new book and I'm doing a case study on the Peloponnesian Wars. And, and so I think the answer is, is the <laughs> Delian League, actually where Athens allies paid tribute to Athens in exchange for Athens building a fleet to protect uh, the allies. Out historian by the political scientists. Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, um, so, so I think there is one uh, example at least 2,000 years ago, but I don't, I don't know if there are more, more recent. Um, but, but I wanted to finish with a question, uh, because it seemed like, Professor Glazer, uh, that you wanted to get into this issue of no first use more. So I'll um, take you up on that. Uh, because you seem to be arguing that there are certain situations uh, in protecting our allies where we should declare that nuclear weapons are off the table. Uh, so just to provide a counter to that, you know, our, our, no, our, our nuclear policy has never been that nuclear use would be the necessary or the automatic response to any attack. Uh, rather, it's just been to say that it's one of the options on the table. Um, so what's the uh, problem with leaving it on the table? Uh, maybe it provides us some deterrent benefit if the adversary thinks nuclear weapons might be used. Uh, and if it actually came to that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have to use nuclear weapons. We could always use conventional uh, forces if it was, uh, at the time, seen to be more pragmatic. Um, so I guess, what's the case for ruling um, nuclear weapons out from the beginning? So, so I should start there. So yeah, it's, it's a very good question, because there's value in the potential nuclear bluff. Um, and you, can, you always have control over your weapons. So as, low as, as long as it's just a very, it's what I call a low risk posture where you wouldn't lose control of your weapons by putting them on alert and so forth, um, you could say it would be essentially no risk. And so I think that the, um, the, the points I would make at least to, um, and I agree, so I don't think it's, I think it's much more a question of how you plan than what you say. And so, um, but there are some potential downsides. So one is if you, if you knowingly are not going to rely on nuclear weapons, there is, um, or if, you're, if you think you might rely on nuclear weapons, there's some risk you will underinvest in conventional forces. Um, and so, in some ways, it's, there might be scenarios in which you just want to commit 
and say we're going to build adequate forces and just not rely on nuclear. So it's not really about the ad adversary, it's about yourself, right? Because the bluffing is always the advantage. Um, and so I think that's potentially valuable. Um, although it would not be, for it, let's, in the key cases that I said, I don't think it's, it's not important for the saying, how could they are you? Because you're not going to plan to. I also think it's just, I also worry that the United States, and so once again, it's about the United States side, because the bluff is always a bluff. Um, there's some danger that we could lose track of the fact that there are some wars that just should never be nuclear. And so it's actually good for us to know ahead of time that we would not use nuclear weapons. And I'm not sure you can sort of have both sides of it, which is constantly keep the nuclear weapons on the table, but know in your own planning um, that you definitely won't use them. In other words, it's hard to bluff, and all, but have the, everybody who's relevant know that it's a bluff. So I would say those, uh, I mean, both of those are slightly not tricky questions, but it all has to do on the US side, because you're right, all else being equal, as long as you're not threatening the adversary's forces, and as long as you're not um, potentially losing control of your own forces, there's no downside to just having a declaratory doctrine. Wonderful. Uh, well, I know I have uh, many more questions, but I see a lot of uh, smart students in the audience, uh, a lot of other um, expertise. Uh, so now I want to open it up to the audience for your uh, Q&A. Uh, there are some microphones uh, coming down the aisle, so um, please, if you'd like to ask a question, um, stand up, come to the center of the aisle, uh, take a microphone. Uh, and it would be wonderful if you could ident identify yourself. Let us know your name and, and your affiliation. Um, and I will provide uh, some affirmative action to students, uh, uh, <laughs> students who have turned out. Um, uh, we'd love to hear your voices. So it looks like we have one question uh, down here in the third row. Thank you. Hi, my name's Justin Lewis. I'm a recent graduate of the Security Studies program. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, just a little bit of background. So in 2014, um, Alexander um, Ansarov came up with a tentative list of targets that the North Korean military would launch uh, nuclear weapons at uh, in the Asia Pacific region. And they all encompassed uh, US military bases in South Korea and Japan and Guam and even military bases in the continental United States. So my question is, assuming that list can be taken at face value, how would that affect um, U.S. decision making on extended deterrence in the region? Thank you. Great. Who would like to take it? Well, I'm happy to start. Um, <clears throat> well, I can't confirm his list, frankly. I haven't seen it. Um, um, it would make eminent sense in a strategy of bargaining and coercion that North Korea would uh, target U.S. allies and U.S. bases before targeting the United States. Although it's tried to bring home that it's targeting all of those. And you may recall the, the um, video and um, um, photographs that were released with Kim Jong-un reviewing his targeting plans in front of a giant map showing North Korean nuclear tip missiles coming in and landing on Austin, Texas. Um, who knows what the purpose of that particular message was, other than, other than to bring home that the American homeland was, was at risk. Um, I'd say fundamentally this kind of signaling, um, we and our allies have tried hard to uh, not react to in, in, in the context of a, a basic reaction. But in other words, there is a tendency to react to each new development in North Korean policy and posture by saying, oh my God, we have to do something new. What, we obviously haven't done enough, so what more are we going to do now? Oh, now, now what are we going to do? Oh, now what are we going to do? It disempowers us and puts the initiative in, in his hands. Uh, the alliance, the U.S. ROK alliance, the U.S. Japan alliance, uh, the two alliances, sometimes working collaboratively, have been taking steps really since the 2001 nuclear posture review to adapt and strengthen deterrence for this emerging threat and tr while at the same time trying to reduce reliance on nuclear weapons in that deterrence posture on the assessment that it's not credible for to, as a threat to deal with many of the forms of aggression of which North Korea might be capable. So we don't want to over-rely on nuclear weapons. On the other hand, we don't want to write nuclear weapons out of the equation because they remain relevant to certain unique nuclear threats from, from the North. Uh, so the alliances responded, the alliances have responded to the emerging uh, 
North Korean nuclear capabilities with um, conventional forces aimed at uh, strengthening the defense of the South, preventing the fait accompli strategy, um, the introduction of regional missile defense to reduce the coercive threat of limited missile strikes from the North, the introduction of homeland defense by the United States meant to do that recoupling job, at least for a while, um, and preparation for North Korean capabilities in cyberspace and outer space, which we've seen hints of, and more than hints, developing. So a comprehensive approach, including a nuclear component. I'd say one last thing, which is, Extended deterrence is, of course, as a number of speakers have indicated, bo about both capability and intent. Uh, and to the extent there are regularly doubts about the intention of the United States to make good on its commitments to its allies, especially if it's running a nuclear threat, um, there have been clear presidential statements of intent. Uh, and President Obama went to both Tokyo and Seoul uh, to, to clearly underline the nuclear commitment to the defense of these two allies. Frank or um, Charlie? Okay. Uh, we'll go back to the audience. Uh, who would like to ask the next question? Looks like we have uh, one here, down here, and, and back there. Good morning, gentlemen. Joshua Olson, current SSP student. Um, as you said, one of the main challenges to that extended deterrence right now is establishing the credibility and articulating the assurances to our uh, allies. Given the current administration's uh, transactional comments uh, towards their approach to certain allies, newer allies to some of our um, organizations. What do you recommend as our greatest assets right now to establish that credibility? You want me to take this one? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go, go first. Yeah. Well, you know, it's um, interesting, you know, and in, um, I'll, I'll go first and then turn it over to my uh, panelist. You know, uh, usually when we think about uh, deterrence and extended deterrence, you have this credibility problem. So you have leaders making statements uh, saying that they're committed, uh, but the question is, uh, are they serious or not? Will they stand behind this, or is this cheap talk? Uh, and so the union, you have to take additional costly measures for deploying forces, other things, uh, to show that uh, you're serious, that, um, that it's not just cheap talk. Uh, one of the interesting things we have in um, uh, this uh, current environment is that uh, some of the commitments and some of the language uh, isn't as uh, clear as it had been in the past in terms of what our uh, commitments are. At the same time, we have uh, some steps, I think, that on the ground are actually strengthening uh, deterrence. You know, Europe is a good example. Uh, at the same time that we have questions uh, about the future of the NATO alliance, uh, we have the Trump administration putting in place uh, low yield, new low-yield nuclear weapons to deal with the threat of Russian nuclear de-escalation strikes, uh, strengthening missile defense in Europe. Uh, and so we have uh, a situation where I think the actions are, are uh, speaking louder than, or well, you have the actions and the words, and so the question is, is which is speaking louder? But I think uh, on balance, it, it hurts um, uh, extended deterrence. You know, ideally, you want the, the strong commitment verbally uh, and also have that backed up with, with policies on the ground. I would just add, I think that it's going to take a, a, a long time to make up for some of the damage that the Trump administration has done, because it's very hard to maintain credibility of al your credibility to allies in these kind of situations. And especially, I would say, in Asia, where the geopolitical balance is changing so much, um, we're facing a, a sort of fluid and new situation, not year by year, but over time. You know, and we would have had doubts, there would have been doubts about our determination and ability to stay anyway. And then by treating it very lightly, I think it will take a, a, quite a while because even with a new administration, there's gonna be the concern that there could be another Trump-like administration that just doesn't place the same priorities. So um, hopefully, I mean, to the extent that you think the alliances are important, which most people in the establishment, security establishment do, not everybody does, but if you think they're important, then it's gonna take a number of new presidential administrations to sort of make up for the damage, I would say. So um, perhaps just to be provocative, far be it for me to defend the Trump administration, but what I'm struck by with the mystery of credibility is how we've seen this story again and again. I was thinking about Dulles giving his agonizing reappraisal strategy when the French um, voted against the European army or how the Radford plan which came out right after the Solarium exercise, which talked about pulling troops out of Europe and 
throughout the Eisenhower administration, there was a constant leaking about how uh, the commitment to NATO was uncertain. Um, JFK, the same thing, for all the talk of flexible response, one of the things that you'd see again and again was just his desire, his just complete irritation with the French and the Germans and their inability to pull their weight. LBJ with Vietnam, you know, Nick, and you look at East Asia, if during the double shocks opening to China and the ending of Bretton Woods at a time when the U.S. is leaving um, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, if there wasn't a credibility problem then in terms of extended nuclear deterrence for Japan, I don't know when there would be. Uh, same Carter administration. Reagan, when they negotiate the INF, you know, the namesake of my center wrote this big piece saying this is going to be a disaster because we were selling out the uh, Europeans and decoupling. So I think one of the things we need to study and need to understand more is how, and I, I really, I hadn't thought about what Brad had said, which is exactly right, which is I always just assumed when this extended deterrence weakens that the natural inclinations for states to proliferate. And no, it could also be to appease. And I think given that those are such stark choices, the countries that are involved in it will go to great, 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 great lengths to continue even if it gets pulled thinner and thinner. And so I think this is one of those issues where it's kind of the dog that doesn't bark. As far as I can tell, I haven't seen anybody moving any closer to either of the positions that Brad talked about just yet. I mean, who knows? We all say, like, you can, one of the things that everyone said in the beginning was, well, we can survive four years, not eight years. But um, I don't know. I think it's a great puzzle why, despite this rhetoric, it's actually it's very hard to measure. And again, of course, with deterrence, you're, you're, you're talking about things like signaling, uncertainty, resolve, fear. They're all, you, know, you can't measure these things. You can't see them. They're psychological. You only know them ex post. I mean, we're just guessing, right? We're just guessing till we're not. So I think this is an area that I would have expected far more damage, and I'm struck by how little it seems to have mattered. I'd just add a brief, brief comment directly on this line. For allies under the U.S. nuclear umbrella, they, they are dependent. They are, de they are dependent states whose security is hostage to a fickle democracy. Uh, and it's the security, not all, all of their security, it's the security when their vital interests are at risk. And they, they have lived with this insecurity for decades. And it's dialed up pretty high right now. It can probably be dialed down in a, in a different context. And those allies who are the professional America watchers in their countries all, all say that we, we know your leadership comes and goes, so we look for the deep anchor in your society. And we've been very comforted that our dependence upon you for decades was the right bet. And now we're not so sure. So it's not so much in the personality of the president but in their reading of our body politic. That's the source of trouble. Uh, next question in the back. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Yes, afternoon. Uh, my name is Connor Clark. I'm uh, actually visiting today from University of Maryland as a graduate student in the School of Public Policy. I did want to ask how systems like that can be a game changer on the theoretical and decision-making basis. Um, or, you know, it does seem, from my limited understanding, that it is getting better. It is doing uh, more successful interception tests. Uh, you know, not, uh, the, the total fraction is separated out between, okay, the first several weren't that successful, then it, the percentage of success rate has ticked up, and now we are seeing real results. So, say, if another 22 months go by, um, and we managed to stay out of a nuclear war, and we do have a more conventional administration. Um, how does that, how does that, 22 months in the future, more conventional administration, a more successful interception system, how does that change extended deterrence in how threat actors like uh, North Korea or even China might start thinking about it? 
And I think I might have missed the first part of the question. It's about how missile defense. Uh, can yeah, it, it, to, uh, it does uh, seem where we, the USA, is starting to get real results out of it. And it would seem that a North Korean missile, if, if North Korea knows that we actually have a really good chance of shooting down their missile, how does that change their thinking? Okay. How great. does it change uh, China's thinking about North Korea? Got it. Thanks yeah. very much. Th thank you for missile helping defense me clarify. Missile deterrence. Brad, I know this is something yeah. you've thought about. Uh, I have, and it is an area where there was no, th no real theory about the application of missile defense to the regional deterrence problem. All of our theorizing about missile defense was at the grand strategic level. Uh, and that's the, er the domain where the hit-to-kill technology is still troubled, uh, which is part of the reason the Russians assume that what we're really doing is just developing nuclear interceptors. Uh, and that's, what, that's part of what troubles them. But in the regional context, these, these defenses against short and intermediate range ballistic missiles are pretty good. I mean, they're, they're capable of performing with a high degree of reliability and effectiveness in knocking down a few, not in, not in knocking down all of the things that, that a country might shoot. And it's from that that their strategic virtue derives, which is we can't ask of missile defense that it negate all of the threats. They're easily overwhelmed uh, in a long campaign of war. But if, as we've discussed, regional wars are essentially wars of bargaining, coercion, brinkmanship, if you can compel North Korea, if North Korea believes it can fire one missile and say, okay, I'm, re I'm ready to sue for peace, now are you? And I got more if you're not. That's one dynamic for the North. If North Korea has to contemplate firing 50 to get one through, well, firing 50 missiles at regional targets isn't going to look like a bargaining brinkmanship ta tactic to those who are being attacked. It's going to look like war. And thus, presumably, deterrable by other means or winnable by other means. So the, the theory of regional limited ballistic missile defense is that it negates the regional challenger's confidence in his ability to coerce with missile-backed threats. And if it's all about brinkmanship and blackmail and not about war fighting, then that limited missile defense capability is crippling to his strategy, which is good for deterrence. Frank or Charlie, would you like to respond? Okay. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, and I've, I see we have a lot of hands. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and collect all the questions. I'll ask the panelists to take good notes, and then we'll turn back to them for a final comment before uh, wrapping up. Um, so I see one there, uh, Professor Gerber, uh, one here, uh, maybe a couple more. So please go ahead. And if you could be brief, please. Sure. Um, real quick, I haven't heard um, anything about adversary use of cyber operations against nuclear command and control infrastructure. And I'm pretty interested in knowing how uh, extended deterrence in light of these um, increasing operations by our adversaries, especially without any formal rules of engagement in place, is impacting U.S. national security policy. Okay, great. How do cyber operations uh, affect nuclear deterrence? Um, Professor Burton Gerber. Uh, credibility uh, requires that it be credible both to the adversary and to the allies or those who are being protected, but it also means that it's credible to our own people and our own forces. And so I wonder how m the questions of modernization and of greater uh, devotion to arms control affect the credibility. Great. Uh, and right here. Mark Wittekopen, National Defense University. Uh, how does Congress, what Congress does, what role does Congress play in uh, assuring that extended deterrence is credible? Um, any more questions? Okay, it looks like we've uh, exhausted the questions, so now what we'll do, we'll turn back to the panelists to answer those questions, offer any final remarks, uh, and then we'll wrap up. And I think we'll just go uh, in the order that the, they spoke. So, uh, Professor Glazer, if you're ready. Okay. 
So I wasn't quite sure on what the cyber and command and control question was, so I'll just answer very generally. <laughs> um, so I mean, I think there are two pieces to it. One is if you, broadly thinking about nuclear deterrence, you need to have, you would like to have and benefit when you have deep confidence in your ability to retaliate. So if, a, you know, if an adversary can start to raise doubts about that, that can also then encourage them to, or make them more willing to launch um, nuclear or conventional attacks against your systems because you may already be somewhat weakened. In terms of extended deterrence, I don't see it, but I haven't, you know, I have, it's not something I've really worked through. I don't see it having a separate um, implication. If you think about extended deterrence being largely limited, the, um, the adversary may not want to attack command and control for a variety of reasons because the logic of limited war requires control of forces on both sides. So it's possible that those types of threats, depending upon how you're envisioning a limited war or an extended deterrence, um, there might be some restraint in the use of cyber as well as in the types of attacks that would be launched. Um, it could also come down to exactly the nature of cyber attacks. Not all cyber attacks would be designed to fully disable um, central nuclear command and control. And there are actually some possibilities to target um, regional warning systems without getting involved in early warning systems. So it depends upon really quite what you're thinking about. Um, one thing that's very obviously murky on the cyber side is there's a huge amount of uncertainty on the attacker side about whether it will work and on the attack side about what's actually happened. So once again, in terms of limited war, it tends to probably be not a great instrument. It's much more um, in the nuclear realm, it may be that once it's most important when states start to think about all out attacks. But this is sort of, you know, very, uh, I think just people are just starting to think through those pieces. On credibility on arms control uh, and modernization, um, again, I'm not quite sure what the question was. I do think that the credibility of threats depends upon having um, the adversary knowing that you have the capabilities at hand. So, for example, the key argument for U.S. modernization is actually to ensure the long-term capability of U.S. nuclear forces. That should help with our credibility. Um, to the extent that if we saw, and it is one of the few areas we're actually seeing pretty wide bipartisan support for the nuclear modernization. Um, to the extent that, we, that that support broke down, and if adversaries saw that as a lack of commitment to our allies, um, that might start to hurt our credibility. Fortunately, I think in the nuclear realm, we're actually, it's, we're not seeing that right now. So we're a pretty good ground um, in terms, of, unlike some other areas where the domestic politics on the nuclear side is actually um, providing good support to extend the deterrence through its support for modernization. Great, thanks. Um, Professor Gavin. Great, well, thank you, um, Matt, for sharing this, and thanks for all the great questions, and I've learned a ton. Um, on the cyber point, I've learned a, I mean, this is not something I know a lot about, but I've learned a bunch from Keir and Daryl and Austin and Brendan and Caitlin and you, Matt. One of the things I've come away with is that we're, we think of nuclear weapons as a new technology. It's an old technology, and it's going through a lot of transformations. And then there's a lot of technologies that support the nuclear infrastructure and the various grand strategies we pursue that are, affect nuclear operations. And so what we want stall is a very, very thick red line between the two has faded enormously, and cyber is one of the key. I always think to myself, imagine U.S. Cyber Command had the capability, which is plausible, to shut down China's retaliatory capability, um, and no one's hurt, right? No building is affected, but that's clearly a preemptive strike. What is that? And I think we are, because of these new technological changes um, and the blurring that is happening between various conventional uh, cyber uh, machine learning technologies, um, I think we're going to have to think about this more. On the public opinion and modernization, I think there's, again, there's another one of these dilemmas. Nuclear weapons are all about dilemmas, right? So I think generally people support the idea of modernization to increase capabilities to increase deterrence, but I don't think there's if you were to go out and poll Iowa right now and say, should we be playing 12 games of nuclear chicken a day over Estonia, um, would that be kind of a winning ticket either, on either side, right? So, um, I, I, and I don't really know how to think about this. The one thing I will say is that if we were having this meeting outside of the United States, say in Vienna or Melbourne or Tokyo, the conversation would be much, much different. And there is this, 
you know, we, no one has mentioned, I think yet today, the ban treaty, right? And so, but you go to Europe, you go to anywhere else in the rest of the world, people think the kind of conversations we're having are just totally bonkers, right? We remember this from our Melbourne experience, right? And that's a, that, I, I don't know how to think about that, but I don't think one should, it, it is a factor. I don't know how to think about it. There's domestic public opinion, which is what you asked about, but there's also this global public opinion. On Congress, again, another puzzle. Uh, when you look at the, this idea of constructing a preemptive, pre-delegated, centralized authority strategy, Congress has very rarely intervened in these decisions. Matt Waxman's done some very interesting work on the legal side of this. I, I, I used to argue with him that, that the actual rules of MC48 were probably unconstitutional, um, that you could actually, that a commander in the field could get the United States involved in World War III. And in the Eisenhower period, it wasn't even clear it had to be an American. And that's not really how our Constitution is written. But Congress stays far away from this. And the irony is, is where do they involve themselves in proliferation and non-proliferation? Congress has been all over that from the beginning. They spend an enormous amount of time. They can come up with the eight or 10 acts that they've intervened to sort of push the executive branch in one direction or another. Congress doesn't touch this. And I think it's well worth thinking and asking why. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Roberts, bring us home. Uh, each topic in turn briefly, cyber and NC2 or 3, depending on what you want to count. Um, I th my, I, my observation is that this debate about the impact of cyber offense and defense on nuclear command and control is usually conducted within the old context, which is to say in the context when we're worried about a preemptive strike on the command and control system as a way to prevent us from engaging in a, in a large-scale nuclear retaliatory response to a large-scale strike on the United States. That's an important problem. I, I don't want to screw that, our ability to deal with that problem, I don't want to screw that up. But it's not the main problem in the 21st century. It's the least plausible of the many Im almost implausible pathways to nuclear conflict. Um, in shorthand, we need a command and control system that can not only enable the president to do the seven minute multiple choice quiz, so to speak, while he's moving, um, but also to pass the essay test, uh, which is to say to be in a, in a context in which he can deliberate with all the time available to him or her, uh, with all of the stakeholders in the decision, who would be numerous, uh, and for that, um, you need a resilient command and control system and a communication system that can reach all of those people and enable secure conversation. Uh, and if we find ourselves in a regional war that transitions into the nuclear domain, we have to understand that our command and control system is already eroded because it's been the subject of attack in an ongoing regional war. Uh, and this is gonna make that transition point harder than we thought it would be in the context of a bold out of the blue, massive all-out nuclear attack. So there's a different context today to think about uh, the resilience, cyber resilience of our command and control systems. Uh, on, on, to relate the, modern, the questions about modernization and arms control, specifically to the question of deterrence credibility, which I think is where you were, were pointing us, um, they both have an impact on the credibility of our threats in the nuclear domain and the promises we make to our allies. Uh, I'm a supporter of the Trump administration's proposals for two supplemental low yield capabilities for the arsenal. Not because I think Mr. Putin or Kim Jong-un sits at his desk and thinks, okay, they've got 27, uh, 127 kiloton weapons, but they don't have any or they've only got three 60 kiloton weapons so I can get away with it. This seems implausible. But the signal that we have sent by 30 years of downsizing the arsenal, ours is a political system that permits reductions. We've done this with gusto. Um, ours is a political system that doesn't permit any growth or any de adaptation in, in the arsenal. Uh, and and signaling that we have the political resolve to do something different in light of the new security context in Europe. Let's, let's be clear, 
Um, since the end of the Cold War, the United States has withdrawn 97% of the nuclear weapons that it had deployed in Europe. Uh, in the, when the current 10-year modernization program that the Russians are engaged in concludes next year, uh, according to Defense Minister Shoigu last week, uh, the number of uh, carriers of weapons capable of delivering weapons against the West will have increased by a factor of 30, and the number of cruise missiles capable of carrying nuclear weapons capable of targeting Western targets increased by a factor of, I think it's 18. Don't cite me on the numbers, I'm not sure, it's Shoigu's, Shoigu's comments. That's a stark mismatch. What conclusion, if you're sitting in the Kremlin, would you draw? So I think there's an argument for modernization that lends credibility to the alliance's deterrent strategy. And on arms control, I would say, roughly speaking for American credibility on deterrence, Prague hurt, New START helped. Uh, if you send the message that you're just willy-nilly looking to reduce nuclear weapons without regard to context, the people who care about the context and conditions get worried. Um, but if you are able to craft a, a means to reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons in a manner that's verifiable and provides predictability and transparency for them as well, then you're contributing uh, to the credibility of your overall nuclear strategy. Um, lastly, the Congress. Uh, I, th I think of the answer a, a, a little differently, which is, the Congress has seen the need since the end of the Cold War to be a more effective player in the development and implementation of U.S. nuclear strategy and of U.S. defense strategy generally. So NPRs are generally commissioned by the Congress, as are QDRs, now called National Defense Strategy Reviews, as are Missile Defense Reviews, et cetera, et cetera. These are reports to the Congress to explain the nature of the strategy and policy and budget choices being made by the administration. And in 2007, the Congress felt it had become such a poor partner in the nuclear policy process that it created the Bipartisan Strategic Posture Commission and asked them two simple questions. Is there anything you can agree about? Because it sure doesn't look like it. Uh, and, and if so, what? And one of the recommendations of the Posture Commission was avoid um, pet projects, whether you're on the, on the left or on the right on this agenda, because either will jeopardize the core business of modernizing the nuclear deterrent is a 30-year problem. Uh, and so I, I would say that at a time when we Americans must marvel at the chaos and bitterness of division in the Congress on nuclear policy, it's actually, uh, as, as um, Charlie indicated, uh, bipartisan in its, in its approach, serious, purposeful, wants to push a debate, wants to keep the debate going, which is appropriate and I think necessary and helpful. Um, but um, uh, a source of continuity in policy, not a source of disconnection in policy. Well, it's been a rich discussion. I'd be happy to continue this conversation all afternoon, but I'm afraid that we're out of time. Uh, I hope you found it as interesting as I did. And uh, please uh, join me in helping to thank our panelists for the remarks.